Here we go. Okay, guys, so here fundamentally is the scoop. The lab that you have in front of you, well, the parts of the lab that you have in front of you just became your rough draft. If at the end of the day, you can say to yourself, this lab that I have in front of me is still good to turn in, guys, at the end of the day today, you're gonna huck a staple in that thing and you're gonna turn it in and you're done. I'll be honest with you, the chances of that are close to zero, but let's see if you can get past even the beginning of this. So guys, here's what we're going to do. In order to help you now perfect your labs, and guys, let me tell you right now, at the end of this, when we're done talking about everything that should be on your labs, guys, if, if it's not good to turn in, you can go home tonight, perfect your labs. They will then be due on Thursday. And guys, you should all get perfect scores on this lab. If you don't, that completely falls on your shoulders because we're going to spend the next hour and we're going to talk about what these labs should look like. So guys, understand this is your opportunity to get this thing dialed in. So guys, in that spirit, here's what we're going to do. Go to the conclusions of your lab. And what I'd like you to do, please, is read your answer to conclusion question number one. Give you a second to read over your answers. And then guys, once you've had the opportunity to read over your answers, we're actually then going to talk about um, what those answers should be. Now understand, this is why I had you print your conclusions, so that you can then annotate into your conclusion answers so that you can actually see these are the changes that I need to make if in fact you need to make changes. So guys, let's remind ourselves, uh, did you have a chance to read yours? You're okay? Okay, so guys, let's remind ourselves, what did conclusion question number one say? And it simply said this, what effect does the addition or removal of energy have on the molecules of a substance? So guys, let's talk about expectations before we talk about details. Understand that you need to be writing incomplete sentences. So in order to answer this question completely, your answer would probably begin with the addition or removal of energy from a substance, fill in the rest. So guys, as, and it doesn't have to be that, but you will be writing in complete sentences. So the addition or removal of energy from a substance, what does it do to the substance? So guys, let's take a, a, a step back in time and let's think about what we did on Friday. Okay, so here's how the lab went. We put some, and this is the boiling point part. So guys, we put some water in a beaker, right? And then we had a Bunsen burner. And by the way, guys, your graphs looked wonderful for this one. So guys, we put some water in a beaker and at time zero, right, zero, we stuck the burner underneath the beaker. We wrote down the temperature. 30 seconds later, we wrote down the temperature. And what did the temperature do? It went up. And then 30 seconds later, it went up. And 30 seconds later, it went up. And so guys, what we saw was this. Let's just do the whole story. So we put the Bunsen burner underneath the beaker. And remember, this is all about the question, adding energy to a substance. So guys, we are adding energy to a substance and the temperature goes up and up and up, just like in your graphs, right? The temperature goes up and up and up. And then at some magic moment, you took the Bunsen burner away and the temperature stopped going up, right? So how did you reflect that in your answers? So let's talk about the answer. So guys, we stuck the Bunsen burner underneath the water and as we are adding energy, what did that do to the substance? The temperature went up. So that should be part of your answer to question number one. The addition or removal of energy causes the temperature of the substance to change. In the case of the ice water, you weren't adding energy with the flame, you were removing energy with ice, but fundamentally from what you experienced, adding or removing energy from a substance changes its temperature. 
Can we all sign off on that? Okay, and so guys, remember again what we did. We put the Bunsen burner underneath here, perfect evidence of this. Adding energy caused the temperature to go up. And then if you remember again, at some point, you just took the Bunsen burner away and the temperature stopped going up, right? Yeah? Oh, heavens, I hope not. No, because that's not what you did. So guys, what's wrong with what I just showed you? So hold on a second. You, if, if you understand what we're saying, you understand the conflict that we just created. Because guys, we've established a principle that adding energy to a substance causes its temperature to go up. But I've seen your graphs and you all saw this. Guys, at some point, the temperature stopped going up and it's not because you removed the Bunsen burner. That means that our answer is incomplete. Because guys, if adding energy to a substance causes its temperature to go up, this temperature would have gone up infinitely and it would have never stopped going up. But guys, at some point, the temperature stopped going up, which means right now our answer is only half correct. Because it is true that sometimes adding energy to a substance makes the temperature go up. But guys, if that was true, then we would have had to remove the Bunsen burner to make the temperature stop changing. So what's the other part of the answer? What else can adding energy do? Yeah. That's temperature. You're going to find that out in a minute, that when the temperature goes up, the molecule speed's changing. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And what happened at 97 degrees? And, but what's happening to the substance? It's changing phase. Guys, that is the complete answer to question number one. What effect does the addition or removal of energy have on the molecules of a substance? We've already got half of it. We already know that the addition or removal of energy can cause a change in temperature. And you know what, I wanna flip this around. So guys, we're gonna say it this way because I'm finding that maybe some of you don't know this, so let me just put it this way. So guys, this can cause a change in temperature, which apparently I can't spell. Um, and guys, if you don't understand this, let's just say it um, and we'll do it this way. So guys, the idea here is that this can cause a change in temperature. And if you don't understand this, that is molecular speed. As the temperature goes up, the molecules are moving faster. As the temperature goes down, they're moving slower. But guys, again, understand that this is only half the answer, because if this was the complete answer, then the temperature would have gone up forever. So Sam gave us the other part of the answer, which is this. It can also cause a change in phase. In the case of the first trial, that was the water boiling. In the case of the second trial, that was the wax freezing. But guys, that's the other thing that adding or removing energy can do. It can change the phase. But here's the interesting other thing that I would encourage you to add. Did you guys know this? These can't happen at the same time. If water is boiling, it's not getting hotter. If wax is freezing, it's not getting colder. Guys, when something goes through a phase change, its temperature does not change. And if something's temperature is changing, it's not going through a phase change. It's impossible for those two things to happen at the same time. That's why your graphs leveled off. Yeah. Exactly, and so then you saw that in your graphs, right? The temperature went up as you added energy because the molecules are moving faster, and then at some point, the temperature stopped going up, and that's when it started to boil. Now, and down, this was sorted to your graph. Guys, on the freezing point graphs, you probably noticed, and I talked with some of you because it wasn't as obvious, that when you stuck the wax in the ice, your temperature went down quickly, and then it should have leveled out a little bit. Did you figure out what was up? You're okay, did it level out? Was, was yours, okay. So it should have leveled out slightly and then dropped again. And, in, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. But when your wax went horizontal, that's when it was freezing. So guys, these can never happen at the same time. That's conclusion question four. That's where we're about to get, yep. So guys, you good on question one? 
Anything that you want to talk about, any, any clarification that you need, do you feel now like you can completely and correctly answer question one? Yeah. Absolutely. But understand that if you're going to say that, then you also need to say the other part, which is if you remove heat, the molecules move slower. Or you could just make a generic statement that says adding or removing changes the speed. But then also don't forget you've got to mention changing phase. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So guys, you ready for this? Who's still going to turn in their lab at the end of the day? <laughs> You're close. Guys, we just got past conclusion question one. So now let's look at conclusion question two, which frankly isn't even in my notes because it's really straightforward. Guys, question number two, paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact question. It basically says, how do we measure this effect? So what is the this referring to? Well, it's this. How do we measure the effect of energy on temperature and phase? A thermometer. Yeah, guys, question number two is just a thermometer. Guys, a thermometer is quite literally a molecular speed meter. The higher the temperature, the faster the molecules. In AP, we actually calculate how fast the molecules are moving because you also need to know their mass. If you've taken physics, that might make sense. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. But guys, knowing their temperature, you can actually figure out how fast on average these molecules are moving. But fundamentally, you just need to know the answer to question number two is a thermometer. And I think you could have tackled that in one concise sentence. You guys okay on question two? Okay, so guys, at this point, I think maybe I should pause for a second because I saw enough of your responses because you printed them. Um, having looked at them, guys, this is not one paragraph for all of your conclusions. You've just written a short paragraph for question number one and a one sentence answer for question number two. You need to structure your conclusions. Guys, I'm going to grade with a fine tooth comb you're writing. And this is, if this is just one run on paragraph, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Make sure that you're writing well. Um, I would be more than happy to go, if you want to bring your conclusions to me tomorrow, I'd be more than happy to edit with you. But guys, the expectations are way up here. So you guys good on question two? Yeah. Was that on question one? Well, so you're talking about so. So the question is, how do we measure this effect? How do? Question one. But we didn't. You never touched a balance in lab, right? So try as much as you can, try to answer the questions relative to what we did just in this lab. You're not wrong that things do expand and contract when they heat and cool. But keeping in line with what we did in class, we never measured volumes or densities. So while you're not wrong, let's keep our answers focused just on what we did. Okay. So guys, can we go to question three? Again, you're driving the process. I'm more than happy to take all the time you want. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But make sure you include the thermometer. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. You guys good? Question three. Okay. So guys, question three reads like this. And this is where things are about to get crazy for me. Because while you have the advantage of sliding papers around, I've got to shuffle through slides. And this gets a little messy, but I'll do my best. So guys, question number three says this. Look at your graphs and summarize what happened to temperature over these curves. And so guys, are you noticing how question number three ties back to question one and two? Question number one, we learned that energy changes many times temperature. And now we're finding in question two that we know how to measure that with a thermometer. But now guys, question number three is asking you to look at your graphs and describe what you're seeing. So guys, to do that, I would propose that the next thing we need to do is we need to look at your graphs. So guys, grab your boiling point graph and let's, before we describe anything, let's fix them. 
And Sam, I think you're going to find some things here. You want to grab your, you were missing a lot of this on your graphs. You're going to want to add this. Um, so guys, in your boiling point graphs, here's what you need. You need units on the y-axis that are temperature in Celsius. On the x-axis, your units are, your label is simply energy. It's, as you know, in 30 second time intervals, but we're not even going to mention that. What we're really doing is adding energy over time. Then guys, you'll notice that we've got a title. Um, I just put the boiling point of water. You could do whatever makes sense. The purpose of the title is to help you identify what the graph is representing. Then guys, you should have a series of data points. Your graph should be two thirds the page. All of yours were. Your graphs should be landscaped orientation. All of yours were. And then guys, you should have plotted your points and then connected the dots. You guys okay? Those are the things that have got to be on your graph. With that said, I'd like you to add these two things now that we've already talked. So guys, we understand from experience that when we started this lab, we started with a liquid. Please label that on your graph. This is new, please do it. So guys, we've got the liquid portion of the graph and then we now understand that when the graph went horizontal, it was then boiling. Guys, some of you threw out that data. Looking at your graphs, your boiling section where it went horizontal was like two data points. That's not okay. Yeah, it's repetitious. It's supposed to be. But guys, don't confuse repetitious with no value. Guys, that's important because it's representing the fact that when we're adding energy, the temperature is not changing as it boils. And most of you didn't know that because you got conclusion question one wrong. So guys, horizontal actually communicates a ton of interesting information. So guys, questions about your boiling point graphs? You guys okay? Okay, now, oh, go ahead. I think I know where you're going, so keep going. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, you're fine. You, where you chose to, I mean, this has got to start at zero, right? Yeah, and that's fine. But so if you're, but your data point wasn't rated right 20, so it's just a little, it was like 22 or whatever. And so that's totally fine. Yeah, you don't have to start your Y axis at your first data point. Yeah, you're totally fine. So guys, what else? Okay, now let's answer conclusion question number three. <clears throat> Partly, because conclusion question number three says this. It says, describe, and let me read it. It says, look at your graphs and summarize what happened over your boiling point curve. So guys, we are going to write like the intelligent, literate people that we are, and we are going to write in complete sentences. And to answer this question, we are going to say something like, looking at our boiling point graph, and then we're going to talk about it. So guys, I would encourage you to do this anytime, and I know this is groundbreaking for some of you, because before you write, think. No, no, I know, I know. But guys, Think about the question, think about what's being asked of you, and then formulate an answer. So it is asking us to summarize what this graph looks like. And guys, I would propose to you that as we summarize, what it's asking us to do is give a big picture overview of what we see. So guys, if you look at this from 30 feet, how many parts are there to this graph? How many parts are there to the, the curve, the points? How many parts are there? I would suggest there's two. There's go up and doesn't go up, right? So I would propose to you that if you're going to summarize this graph, you've got to talk about both parts, which will probably require two sentences. So maybe you might say something like this. Looking at the boiling point graph, Initially, when we added energy, the temperature went up. Huh? Then, when the water started to boil, or you don't even need to mention that, you can if you want, but you could say then, at some point, 
the temperature stopped going up. Guys, if you were trying to describe this graph to somebody, whether they know what's going on or not, you've got to be able to describe goes up and doesn't go up. So as you're summarizing what this curve looks like, there's two parts that you've got to describe. If you haven't done that, you're not okay. Yep. So I'd love to know how you did it. I'm, I'm sure it's great, but what did you do? Wonderful. Rather than growth, could we say constant increase? Because it's not getting bigger, it's going up. But I, I love the way that you did that. That's actually a great sentence. So guys, you, you, you okay on this idea? I know for some of you are like, oh my gosh, he actually expected us to sit down and write and it probably wasn't okay if I tried to do this with my thumbs on my cell phone. Go ahead. So long as you have, again, we're summarizing. And many times when you're summarizing, it's not necessarily wrong, but you gotta be careful because summaries typically don't call on individual data points. But if, if, if in that summary, even if you're calling on data points, you've got the idea of go up and don't go up, you're fine. Yeah, okay. So guys, are we okay on that graph? And then, oh, go ahead, Cam. That's awesome. Abs understand that's not in the question. It's not asking you to explain it, so I would be careful. But no, I, and actually, you're going to find out in the next graph, you're going to have to talk about not just changes, but different rates of change. And that's awesome. Um, and not that trying to explain why is wrong, um, but it wasn't a part of the question. Um, but you're, you're fine. We guys good to go on to the rest of this? So guys, now we need to look at our freezing point graphs. Pull that other, and Sam, did you get, you saw you needed units and a title, okay. So guys, pulling up your freezing point graphs now. So we've got, um, again, energy and temperature, energy without units, temperature and degrees Celsius. Um, we've got a title on our graphs. We've got this decrease, and guys, I, I talked with as many of you as I could about this, but just watch here for just a second. What you should see, and don't change your graph. Your graph represents your data. So don't be changing things, but what you, most of you saw this, a decrease and then a leveling. For most of you, it wasn't truly level, but the slope did go down less rapidly and then it dropped again. And guys, so I bring that up because I, and this wasn't in the assignment, but please add it. Initially, you had liquid wax, then, when the, the, the line leveled a bit, um, that's when it was freezing. And guys, let me just tell you right now, if you're curious, I mean, Cam's thinking about explanations. Guys, the, the freezing line for wax is not perfectly horizontal because the wax has impurities in it. And those impurities freeze over a small range of temperatures. And as a result, it it's not exactly horizontal. If we could have purified the wax, then it would have been perfectly level. You don't need to worry about that, but if you're curious. And then it dropped again. And when it started dropping again, that was when all of the wax was solidified and the temperature then continued to drop. So guys, let me give you a second to edit these graphs. And Liz, do you see now why you're gonna to have to switch yours? Okay. So guys, you good here? Anything you need to talk about with your graphs? Go ahead. And that's what I'm saying. From here, you're fine. Because you can see that really well, David. You've got decrease, and then you've got less decrease, and then you've got decrease. I, I can see those three regions easily from here. Can you? Yeah, you're good. That's great. And again, the reason it doesn't go horizontal is because it's impure and that's not your fault. Okay. So guys, can we now answer the second part of conclusion question three? How are you going to start the second section of conclusion question three? You've got to guide your reader to what you're looking at. So guys, now maybe you might say something like looking at or referencing the freezing point graph. Well, however you guide your reader there, 
We're now looking at the freezing point graph. How many sections? Three. So how many things do you need to describe in your summary? Three. So I might say something like this, and boy, my words don't need to be yours. They shouldn't be yours. But if I were you, I would say something like, referencing my freezing point graph, as we removed energy, initially the temperature dropped, dropped rapidly. Then, depending on what you're graph describing my graph, I would say, then the temperature stopped changing. Then, after some period of time, the temperature began to decrease less rapidly. That would be my description. But guys, that may not necessarily jive perfectly with what you saw. Yours may not have dropped less rapidly at the end. Yours may have not gone horizontal in the middle. Many of yours didn't. But guys, you've got to have three descriptions. Drop, less drop, drop. Because that's what all of your data did. And Dallin, you are okay. That so would, would, did yours actually not do that in the middle? Oh, uh, okay. So you're okay then. So you did see something like this then. Beautiful. Okay. So guys, in my little brain, we are now done with conclusion question number three. And again, I'm happy to take all the time you want, um, but I also don't want to waste your time. So, uh, you tell me, are we good to go on? You okay? Okay, so I'm then ready to move to conclusion question number four, which means I've got a yippee skip up here. Um, oh, come on. Oh, wait a second. Here's. Okay, so guys, conclusion question number four then, I believe, reads like this. What are possible explanations for these trends? Because I would propose to you that in order to answer this question, you'd better know what the word these is referring to. So what is these referring to? Which trends? Which trends? Which trends? When did you talk about trends? Question three. Guys, in question number three, you talked about, you summarized the trends on the graphs. So question number four is obviously referring back to question number three and asking you to explain the trends. So how many trends did you reference in question five? Or in question, <laughs> in question three, five, that was weird. So guys, in question number three, you referenced five trends, right? Two in the boiling point graph, goes up, don't go up. And then you referenced three in the second graph, goes down, goes down less rapidly, goes down again. So guys, I would propose to you that if in question number three, you referenced five trends, then in question number four, you're going to talk about five trends. Seems reasonable, right? So, guys, in order to do this, what I would suggest that we do is let's go over uh, to our, how do I do this? I think like this, good. Let's go to our boiling point graph. And guys, let's gather up everything that we know. So what do we know right now? Well, question number one, we know that adding or removing energy from a substance makes the molecules go faster temperature or slower, changes the temperature, which is speed, or it changes the phase. Question number two, we know we use a thermometer to measure that. Question number three, we've described the trends. So now, guys, question number four is asking us to, to, to explain the trends. So, guys, we've got five trends. We're going to talk about them as five trends. But when you write, you are not going to say trend number one. There is no trend in number one, but we are going to talk about this trend first. So guys, the first trend that we're going to talk about, referencing question four, the first trend that we're going to talk about is adding energy to the water and the temperature went up. 
explain it. What is happening at a molecular level that would explain adding energy, the temperature goes up? What's going on, Cam? Yes, good. Yeah. Boom. Beautiful. That was a wonderful way to explain that. Guys, that's it. So how are we going to say that intelligently? Not, and you did, but how are we going to say that in a way that leads our reader? So guys, maybe we start like this. Looking at the boiling point graph, when the temperature went up, the molecules were moving faster. Can we all sign off on that? Temperature up, molecules faster. And I'm more than happy to give you time to write. Y'all okay? But guys, notice what Cam did. He explained it at a molecular level. At a molecular level, temperature goes up, those molecules move faster. You guys good on that? Let's do trend number two. In this graph, trend number two, again, the idea is that as we continue to add energy, the temperature stops changing. What explains it? Good, it's changing, but don't write that down. It's changing phase. But guys, we can do better than that. What is changing when the phase changes? And guys, I know that you've got ideas and I'd love to spend 20 minutes and let you guess, but we're not gonna do that. But we're not gonna answer it now. So guys, here's what we're gonna do. We are going to put a mental placeholder and we are not going to answer right now what explains that the temperature doesn't change when water boils. So if you're jotting down notes to yourself that you're going to use to correct your conclusions, leave a space for, you could even call it trend two, and leave a space because we're not going to answer it yet. But we are now going to go down to our other graph. So guys, we are going to call these, for our purposes, trends three, four, and five. So guys, let's look at trend three. We are removing energy, right, up here. We're removing energy and the temperature is going down. What explains that? The molecules are moving slower. It's the opposite of what we talked about for trend one. So we might say something like this. Looking at the, boy, or at the freezing point graph, initially the temperature was going down because the molecules were moving slower. But that's not the end of the story. Because guys, at some point, the temperature stopped changing. What did you learn in question one? Why did the temperature stop changing? Phase change, it was freezing. But guys, what is happening on a molecular level when that stuff freezes? We're not gonna answer it now. We'll talk about it in a second. Leave a placeholder. That would be trend four. Then guys, trend number five. In trend number five, the temperature started to go down again. What is happening is, what's the explanation that the temperature is going down again? Say it again. Same as three. The molecules are moving slower. In trend number three, the liquid molecules are moving slower. In trend number five, the solid molecules are moving slower, but in either case, the molecules are moving slower. So guys, what fruit did we just pick? Well, we picked the easy fruit. We got the ones in boiling and freezing when the temperature was changing, because we know from question one, when the temperature is changing, the speed is changing. So now we got to pick the more difficult fruit. And guys, we've got to figure out what is happening when something boils and when something freezes. As soon as you're ready to have this conversation, I'm ready to move forward, but I don't want to rush you. You guys ready to talk boiling and freezing? Can we move forward? Is that okay? Any dissenters? Okay. So guys, here's what you're going to do. Oh, go ahead. Oh, baby. Maybe. Could this possibly have anything to do with intermolecular forces? 
seems reasonable given that's what this unit is about, right? Uh, yeah, so guys, here's what we're going to do. Grab your notes page. Some students would call what I'm about to do evil. Some teachers would call this good teaching. Guys, I'm not going to answer for you questions two and four. I'm not going to tell you what happens when something boils. I'm not going to have, I'm not going to tell you what happens when something freezes. Instead, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to tell you the characteristic properties of a solid and a liquid and a gas. And yours are already labeled, right? Solid, liquid, and gas. Okay. So guys, if you can see inside solid water, and I'll show you animations of the actually simulations of this in a minute. This is what it looks like inside of a solid. The molecules are all locked in place. Inside of ice, it actually looks like this. This is why water expands when it freezes. This is what it looks like inside of an ice crystal. Um, these purple sticks represent intermolecular forces, and you'll notice that when the water freezes, there's a lot of empty space inside of it. That's why water expands when it freezes, and it's the only substance that does. So guys, this is what it looks like inside of ice. But are these molecules moving? Yeah, they just sit there and wiggle. They do this. Um, it's kind of like they're on springs and they just sit there and bounce. Then, guys, a liquid looks more like this. Or if you want to look at it like this, this is actually what it looks like inside of liquid water, like so. And then, guys, steam, the molecules are just flying apart. So, what do you need to know about these phases? Well, guys, grab your pencils and let's label these diagrams. The first thing that we need to do is this. We need to finish labeling this diagram. So guys, up here, you guys know this, right? When a solid turns into a liquid, we call that melting. And you may want to draw in these arrows um, so that you can see that I just did, gave you a double-headed arrow. I would encourage you to draw these so that you understand that, that solid going to liquid is melting. And then guys, what do we call the other direction? when a uh, liquid or uh, yeah, a liquid turns into a solid, that's freezing. And by the way, guys, here's an interesting thought. At what temperature does water freeze in Celsius? Zero. What temperature does ice melt in Celsius? Also zero. Guys, these two things happen at the same temperature. They're opposites of each other. If you take liquid water and remove energy, it freezes at zero. If you take ice and melt it, it melts at zero. Those happen at, at the same temperature. Then guys, we take a liquid and turn it into a gas. We call that boiling. Do you guys know what it's called when a gas turns into a liquid? Conden yeah, close. Condensation or to condense. I like consolidate, though. It's descriptive. And guys, of course, you all know what temperature this happens at, right? What temperature does water boil at? 100 degrees Celsius. Liars. Guys, you've got a graph in front of you that proves that's wrong. Look at your graphs. When did it go horizontal? It was not at 100 degrees Celsius. None of you got to 100. And if you did, your thermometer was broken. So guys, what temperature does water boil at? In Orem, 96 degrees. So if your line didn't go horizontal at 96, it's because there's error in your thermometer. But understand, guys, water doesn't always boil at 96. The temperature can change a little bit um, based upon weather patterns. If it's a sunny day, water will boil at a slightly higher temperature. If it's a cloudy, rainy, snowy day, water will boil at a lower temperature because air pressure is what determines the boiling point. High pressure, high boiling point, low pressure, low boiling point. Go ahead. Are you okay? Okay. All right, so guys, now moving along, let's talk about solids. You'll notice underneath solids, there's a place for you to write a ton of information. Here's everything you need to know about solids. First of all, guys, solids have low energy. How do you know that? 
Well, guys, in order to take a substance and make it into a solid like liquid wax, what did you have to do? Remove energy. Solids are low energy systems. Inside these solids, we have systems that are high density, with the exception of ice. Solid water is actually less dense than the liquid. That's why ice cubes float. Um, but guys, in general, solids are more dense than liquids. In addition to that, you need to know that the molecules inside of a solid just sit there and vibrate. Also, guys, inside of solids, these things, these particles have fixed positions. The molecules inside of ice do not have the ability to change position. They're locked in position. As a result, guys, solids do not sock. SOC. So, guys, what does that mean? Well, Here's a solid. What's its shape? It's a cube. How about now? Still a cube. Solids do not take on the shapes of their containers. That's what SOC stands for. Solids do not take on the shapes of their containers. And guys, all of this is true is because in a solid, the particles are very tightly bound by strong intermolecular forces that give them structure. Look, David, it's intermolecular forces. Shh, don't tell them. So guys, now we're gonna pick up the pace a little bit. If you understand that about solids, we're going to have the same conversation about liquids. So what about the energy of liquids? Higher or lower than solids? Higher, a little bit. These are mid-energy, less than gases. What about their densities? Well, with the exception of water, they're in the middle. Their densities tend to be moderate as well. Now, guys, if you could look inside of a liquid, we understand this. If we look inside ice, the molecules are just sitting there vibrating, they're in fixed positions, and they wiggle. So guys, what does it look like if you could look inside a beaker of liquid water? What are these molecules doing? It is chaos. Guys, these molecules are moving around at hundreds of kilometers an hour, smashing into each other, smashing into the walls. I mean, it is full on pandemonium inside there. So the best analogy that I can give you, and I don't know if this is lost on you, it's like a mosh pit. If you've ever been to a concert and been in a mosh pit, you've had this experience where you're in there with your friends, the song starts, the song's over, you have no idea where anybody's at. You're bruised, you're beaten, your friends are gone, it's chaos. Guys, that's what it looks like inside of a liquid. They are amazingly violent systems. It's game on inside these things. So what about the positions of these particles? They are not fixed. They are random. And as a result of this, guys, here's some water. And now I'm going to pour it in here. Does it have the same shape? Nope. It used to be wide and flat, and now it's tall and skinny. The reason, guys, is because liquids toe sock, which, of course, stands for takes on shape of container. Guys, liquids take on the shapes of their containers. All of this is true is because they have loosely bound intermolecular forces, but no structure. How you doing? You okay? Oh, good. So now, guys, let's do gases, and then we're going to be ready to answer conclusion question number uh, four, the two parts we haven't answered. So what about gases? Energy? High. Density? Low. 
Now guys, what are the molecules doing inside of a gas? Remember when we talked about methane and we had those methane molecules with no intermodal, the CH4 molecules, and when we got them out, we just threw them? Because that's what gases do. Gas particles travel in straight lines. They just go away from each other until what happens? I just squeal? <laughs> Let's pretend that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> so guys, what are the molecules of gas doing inside this balloon? They're traveling in straight lines until they hit the balloon. So guys, they travel in straight lines until they run into their container. Okay, so what about their positions? Well, their positions are random. But guys, they're random in a different way. So guys, looking at our balloon, do the molecules in a balloon take on, do they take on the shape of their container? Yeah, but how do liquids and gases do this differently? So the liquid takes on the shape of the container, so does the gas, but what's the difference? Go ahead. Yeah, so in the liquid, I like the way you said that. In the liquid, they're coming together. They don't fill the entire container, but they take on the shape of the container. They come together. In a gas, they take on the shape of the container, but they spread out to fill the whole container. Just a second. And we have an abbreviation for that. It's called TOSVOC. What could the V possibly stand for? Volume. Takes on shape and volume of container. Go ahead, Kim. Couldn't you do what? No, of a single. If you knew what it was colliding with, you could. Um, so, yeah, but to have a. That's true. But understand that in a gas, you don't have individual particles. So then the conversation sort of becomes. Yeah. OK. So, guys, what about intermolecular forces inside of a gas? There aren't any. There are no intermolecular forces in a gas. All right, so guys, we are now ready to answer question four in its entirety. So guys, check this out. Question number four now goes like this. You can write this down with me if you want. But guys, question number four goes like this. I am going to superimpose your point graph goes like this. It starts as a liquid and the temperature goes up. Then it starts to boil. Then guys, in our other graph, we started with a liquid that froze and then became a solid. And we understand in sections one and three and five, the temperature is changing because the speed is changing. Just a second. What we need to talk about now is two and four. Because, oh, is that backwards? How do I make that right? Can I? Would that be okay? Would that screw you up? Because technically what we've really got is, wait, so our graph goes like this, but this is our, no, it doesn't. You're right. Hold on. I've never tried to, I'm doing this on the fly. Help me do this well. So your graphs go like this, but that's liquid. Like that? No, that's right. No, that is right, because the liquid, the liquid cools. Yeah, because the liquid cools, and then it freezes, and then the solid cools. 
it is backwards, but the reason, and the reason that it's backward is because energy is going up all the way across here, and in this graph, it's actually going down. Okay, but guys, regardless, we understand that we're trying to figure out what happens when something freezes, and we're trying to figure out what happens when something boils. So let's talk. Guys, let's do boiling first. In order to answer the question, because remember the answer is, what, are, what is the explanation for what's going on? And guys, we understand the phase is changing. When the temperature stops changing, the phase is changing. But what is changing? Guys, what is changing when a liquid becomes a gas? How are gases different from liquids? Because if we can figure that out, we know what's changing. So what's changing? Fundamentally, how are liquids different than gases? That's it. And they're not just changing. What are they doing? Breaking. Guys, that's what happens when water boils. Here, do this with me. You're adding energy to the water. Check this out. Sam, join me. You're adding energy to the water, and the molecules are moving faster and faster and faster, and the temperature's going up, and all of a sudden the temperature stops going up. And what's happening? It's boiling. And what is happening as it boils? The intermolecular forces are ripping apart, and the molecules are jumping up into the air in the form of steam. So guys, all the energy that you're dumping into the water no longer makes the molecules move faster. It rips the intermolecular forces apart. So literally, guys, this stuff starts moving so fast that bang, and an intermolecular force breaks, and bang, and another one breaks, and it starts flying apart. And as that happens, the temperature can't go up anymore because all the energy is going to break the intermolecular forces. So let's, co let's condense this into an answer, no pun. Guys, so the idea is that when the temperature in the boiling graph, when the temperature is not going up anymore, the intermolecular forces are breaking. And you've got to say it that specifically. When the temperature is not changing, the intermolecular forces are breaking. Go ahead. What's that? Say it again. That's what we're going to do next. Yep. You guys get it? That was, that was what we're calling like trend two. Go ahead, buddy. Bingo. That's it. So guys, are we okay on that one? Okay, so let's do the last one then, guys. And then we've got one more thing to do, and I'm going to show you some simulations. So guys, what about this? What is happening when the temperature of the wax stops going down? We know the answer is it's freezing. But guys, what is it doing? How is a solid different than a liquid? No, and that's interesting because we have IMFs here and we have IMFs here, right? So they both, but you're, I know you're on it, so let's talk. So we've got IMFs in both, right? They're both sticky. They both have IMFs. But how is this different from that? Go ahead. Don't trust Cam. He could be wrong. Then go ahead and trust Cam. Forming what? Yes, a structure. And that's the, that's the word that we use is here we have structure and here we don't. So guys, that's actually what's happening as the liquid wax froze into a solid when the temperature wasn't changing, structure was forming. And those are the words you need to use. When when something freezes, structure is forming. So again, we're not forming intermolecular forces. They're already there inside of a liquid. What we're forming is structure. And guys, now you should have all the answers to all of your conclusion questions. Yeah. Solids do have structure. Well, no. So then if you were to take a solid like ice and melt it into a liquid, then what's going to happen? The structure will collapse. 
So that's what melting is. Melting is the breaking of structure to turn this into this. And that's what we're about to talk about. Yeah, right. Uh, how do I want to choose their structure? Good question. Um, and the answer is this. There's a guiding principle in the universe that says systems will allow anything, water, you, me, whatever. Everything in the universe is always going to, to conditions of lower energy. Balls roll downhill. Things fall apart. You, it's, everything's going lower energy. And so water, liquid water, right? Liquid has a fair amount of energy, but it doesn't want to stay there. You know that if you get water hot and set it out, you come back in an hour, it's cooler. It's always losing energy. So what happens, and you know, the this is cool. Watch what you learned. As the water cools down, what happens to the molecules? They slow down right? And as they slow down, and I'm going to just pick some of these out. So these guys are, these guys are moving like crazy, right? They're going nuts. But as they slow down, as they cool down, they slow down and eventually they move slow enough that they go bing and they form this structure. And it just happens naturally because this is lower energy. So as hot water bleeds energy, as it slows down, eventually they move slow enough that they just lock in place and they form a solid. Well, like, if there's, but, like, water ice, yeah. That was an amazingly well asked. Keep going. I love the way you said that. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. So what? Yes. Ab so, so thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so here's the answer to your question. All, all solids, all solids have different, we call them crystal structures. So for example, this is the crystal structure of ice. This is the crystal structure of table salt. This is the crystal structure of diamond. This is the crystal structure of the graphite in your pencil. So every different solid has a different crystal structure, but the things that they all have in common is they're all locked in place and they all have a somewhat repeatable pattern to their structure. Um, you've probably never noticed this and I wouldn't expect you to, but on the back and don't pull this out, but on the back of your periodic table, it actually shows you what the crystal structures are for all of the, all the elements. Yeah. So every different solid has a different crystal structure and wax's crystal structure is messy. That was what makes it kind of soft and diamonds is very repeatable. That's what makes it hard. But the properties of these solids are determined by their crystal structures. And I don't have to teach that in AP anymore because they wrote it out of the curriculum. But it used, but it used to be you had to know all of that in AP. We don't, we don't anymore. You guys, you guys good? Can we do, can we do one, one more thing to wrap up today? Guys, we're, guys, we're, we're going to do, do, do some, some ground, ground gymnastics. gymnastics. Ready? 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 Guys, guys here, here's what I need you to do. do. You, you, can you can slide your questions out of the way. Grab your graphs and then grab your notes page. So get, so get this out. This, this out. is sort this of sort of interesting. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. interesting. So guys, you guys, we're going to do that. Grab your freezing point graph. graph. Literally, Literally grab. grab. You can even connect it, it, it up. So guys, you guys, we're going to do one your freezing point graph. graph. Guys, you will notice that over here on the left, energy is high, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. On the left, the energy is high. On the right, energy is low because you stuck this in ice and you lost energy. So guys, watch what we're gonna do. Did you see it? See it? Let me do it again. Let me do it again. So guys, here we go again, right? So here we go. Yes. Oh gosh, no. This is gonna take forever. I don't have time for that. Okay. So guys, here's our here's our freezing graph. We have energy going down. Now guys, what we're going to do is take our graph and flip it over. So literally do that. Look, you can look through the light if you need. So now guys, look at what's happening. Now, and check this out with me on the screen. Now energy is going up. So guys, watch. 
Now, down here, we have a solid, and here we have a liquid. Energy is now going up because we flipped it. But guys, if we're going solid to liquid, what's happening on this horizontal part? It's not freezing anymore. What's it doing? It's melting. But now, guys, watch this. Take this graph and slide it down into the left. Do that on your paper, on your desk. And now, oh, you see it? Now, guys, fly in your boiling graph. You now connected them liquid to liquid. But now, guys, you see the thing that you just created? Look familiar? Look familiar? Huh? Guys, hang on. Hang on, because I want to animate this for you. Guys, you just created what is called a phase diagram. Grab your pages. Don't mess with your graphs, but grab your notes page. And guys, you'll notice the thing that you have in front of you is the graph at the bottom of the notes page that I gave you. It goes up, levels out, up, and levels out. We're going to label this, and I'm going to show you some video along the way, and this is how we're going to conclude our day. So guys, your graph looks like this. So let's label some parts. Energy is on the x-axis. Temperature is on the y-axis, just like your graphs. Then guys, let's label these two little tick marks. These are called the melting and boiling points. For water, you know that the melting point is zero and the boiling point in Utah is about 96. But this could be for any substance. So now, guys, let's do this. What phase are we in? Does yours, does yours have the lines? You only have one line, though. You're going to need two. But you can write one above and one below. Guys, what phase are we in down here at these really low temperatures? Solid. So label it. Now, guys, what happens to a solid if we get it hot enough that its structure collapses? It melts. And then once we've got that thing entirely melted, and by the way, guys, did you notice that the whole thing has to melt before it warms up? That means if you've got a cooler full of drinks and ice, and you know how the water melts, and eventually you've got a mixture of ice and water, so long as there's still ice in there, you know that it's still at zero because all of the ice has to melt before any of the water can heat up. It's not. Convection is a whole different thing. I'd love to talk to you about it. But guys, what happens then once all the ice is melted? Then we got a liquid. And then guys, once the liquid starts moving fast enough, eventually the intermolecular forces break. And what do we call that? Boiling. And then once the whole thing, well, then as it boils, it gives off a gas. So now, guys, the question becomes this. As we are adding energy, and this is a summary of conclusion question number four. As we're adding energy, guys, as the temperature goes up, what's happening to the molecules? They're moving faster. So guys, in this region of the graph, we are increasing the speed of the molecules by adding energy. We established that in conclusion question four. Now guys, when something melts right here, when this melts, the temperature doesn't go up anymore. What's happening? What happens when something melts? Not IMFs. What changes in that phase change? structure collapses. So guys, here, oh gosh, here, the structure breaks. Then guys, following that, as we heat the liquid, they move faster. Then what is changing when the substance boils? Good, now the intermolecular forces are breaking. And then if we could capture the steam and continue to heat it, they would move faster.
Yeah. So condensing is forming intermolecular forces. Exactly. Yep. So guys, you good? So let me show this to you. Guys, this is cool. Um, to me, this is the neatest part of the day. So what I'm about to show you are not animations. Guys, animations are cartoons. And these are not cartoons. What I'm about to show you, and these are way slowed down. These are like a thousandth of their actual speed. But guys, I'm, don't start packing up. What I'm about to show you are simulations created by supercomputers over in Sydney, Australia. There's a university professor there that actually got some time on one of Australia's supercomputers to generate these simulations. Guys, this is what all of this stuff actually looks like, slowed down about a thousand times. So guys, inside of a solid, this is what it looks like. Let me zoom into these so you can see them better. Guys, this is actually what it looks like if you could zoom inside of a solid. This is what it looks like inside of ice. And those molecules just sit there and vibrate. And that's literally what it looks like slowed down thousands of times. Now guys, what about melting? Well, this is what melting looks like. These molecules move faster and faster and faster as you heat them up, and as they begin to melt, what's going to happen? You'll see the structure collapse. See, they're moving faster, and eventually they move so fast that the structure breaks down, and they melt. That's what melting looks like. Now what phase are we in? Liquid. That's the mosh pit. So guys, what does it look like inside the mosh pit? Like this. Literally, that's what it looks like inside of a liquid slowed down about a thousand times. It's chaos. Quite literally, it's chaotic. So guys, now let's look at boiling. When a liquid boils, these molecules move faster and faster and faster. Now we're at the surface, because remember, that's where they can leave. And this is what it looks like when they boil. Notice some of them actually come back. Not many, but they do. But guys, this is what boiling looks like as the intermolecular forces break. Then inside of a gas, it actually looks like this. Guys, that's what it looks like in a balloon full of steam. Tons of empty space and molecules flying around. They run into each other. They run into the walls. And guys, it's interesting. They had to do hundreds of hours of this simulation to finally capture a couple molecular collisions because it doesn't happen that much. But this is what it looks like inside of steam. Get the idea? So guys, here's what we're going to do to wrap up the day. Just a second. I want to make sure we get to this. Guys, you have got a homework assignment to do and a lab to finish. Guys, look at homework assignment three in your homework packet. Watch your eyes. See homework assignment three? If you don't have it in front of you, look here. Look familiar? Yeah. Look familiar? Yeah. But guys, read the instructions carefully. This does not just simply say, write down your notes. Guys, it's actually asking you to analyze information. So when I see you on Friday, Thursday, you will turn in your completed labs, and we will grade this homework, and we're doing another lab. It just keeps coming. Garrett, you had a question. Oh, are you sure? We'll talk. Have a good day, you guys.